can move our chairs over slightly. Gary Fettis and uh, Nathan Crawley, please come on up. We have to play a chair game from this point on. He's on. Hello. Is that your original mic? Yes, it is. Okay, we were my given instructions. Mic. That's right. I think you guys have a lot in common with the Grand Budapest Hotel. I don't know. You know, it's like it's the same movie. You could have shared sets. We we took our reference from it. It came out earlier. <laughs> but you didn't have any cupcakes, did you? Yes, we did. Oh, you did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not from Mendel's. Oh, yes, that's right. Uh, the interstellar black hole version. Um, so again, if you give us just sort of brief um, reviews of your education training and how you got into this crazy business. Uh, I started, a, 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 well, I went to college, an art school in Brighton, the south of England, um, just as sort of Maggie Thatcher destroyed England. So I, <laughs> I left for America. Single-handed. Yeah, she did a good job of it. Uh, so I, I came to L.A. Um, and, and kind of bumped into a guy I was at art school with in a bar. And uh, he said they need a bunch of draftsmen um, up at Universal on a, this film, small film called Hook. So uh, I, I, you know, I worked in architecture a lot. Um, so, you know, I went up and saw Norman Garwood uh, and he kind of hired me. So that's how, I mean, that kind of... That's how I started, and I, I didn't leave, really. He got me my next job, which was on Dracula next door. Um, you know, he was great. He was fantastic. Uh, I went to school in San Diego, Cal Western University, and uh, uh, was building sets on the stage for a friend of mine who was an actor, a roommate, and I had some carpentry skills. And uh, after that, I had no ambition to get into film. I wanted to be a builder. And I started that uh, early on after graduating from college. And a friend of mine called me and said, you know, they're hiring guys over at the Paramount lot, prop makers. They're hiring security people right off the lot. So you ought to drag your toolbox over here. It's lightweight like we did on stage. And <laughs> so I did. And I worked. I was working on the Paramount lot. And they were, we were doing, my first picture was the Day of the Locust. And uh, on that lot shooting at the same time was Chinatown, Godfather Two. Um, that was a good year. It was a good year. <laughs> so I just dragged my toolbox around from stage to stage, and then two years later, I had an opportunity to uh, transfer over into set dressing. And I was working with a very good decorator, George Robert Nelson, and he uh, ended up taking me to the Philippines on a movie, Apocalypse Now, because his, his lead man... You came man, back. Yeah, I made it back. So <laughs> that's it. That's how it all started, and uh, here we are. 40 years later. Yeah, that's right. Still in the same rut. <laughs> you know, um, it, I really got, of course, as anyone that would see the movie would, the central concept of Interstellar, or one of them, is that that technical innovation has slowed down and even stopped. Um, I'd like both of you, especially you, Gary, uh, can you describe how this premise impacted you as you expanded upon present-day technology to create the interior spaceship environments. Can you repeat that? Please? Well, just, <laughs> well, I mean, the point the is, part. it's, you know, the, it's, it's a line in the script in the kitchen. The grandfather yeah. says, you know, in the old days, uh, there was a new invention every minute, and now right. there's nothing, it's all stopped. So it seems right. pretty obvious that your spaceship is like based well, on kind we're of We're really not that day. far, maybe 40 years into the future and everything did stop because uh, it, we just ran out of resources. Right. And uh, then the question becomes for the people at that time in the movie, what, what do we do from here? Do we quit? Where, where do we go from here? Uh, we must uh, defy all odds against us and move forward. And everything kind of stopped in terms of technology, I, I think. Chris didn't want to make it futuristic. In early meetings with Nathan, I believe that the, that the idea was to keep it grounded in, in what we know NASA as today. And Nathan could probably explain it a lot better than I because he was involved earlier. So uh, we kept it gritty and uh, tried to reflect man's desperation, you know, at that point. Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we're in science fiction here. So uh, for us, it was about grounding it and sort of describing a, a, a true Americana 
you know, and there were, there were lots of early questions whether to make that farmhouse, you know, the farmhouse of, say, today that might have technology in it, or whether we had to be simplistic and show it as a dust bowl farmhouse that's familiar. And familiar, I think, is key to grounding the science fiction, that we had to ground it all the way. So when, even those, though, the Ranger and the, uh, the Endurance, all those ships are futuristic. They're grounded with NASA. Yeah. You know, they're grounded with NASA, so they feel familiar. And for us, um, that was critical. We didn't, we wanted to keep it simple. We wanted to, even the cameras are mounted on the ships and we shot them on stage. So, you know, that's true to NASA with docking. There's only one point of view when you dock the shuttle into the ISS is, is the camera mount on the ship. Right. So we, you know, we, we were trying very, we were trying to be controlled. Um, and that extended to the ship interiors. Although, <laughs> you know, we, we had a, the usual problems, time and money. So most of those ship interiors are sort of, I was sat on a plane with Chris and we were looking at the galleys of United Planes <laughs> and we're thinking, and that's going to be our, uh, you know, so we asked to see the galleys and the students is like, what are you doing? It's like, we're looking at the toilet. It's like, you know, so when you pull the tape measure, they get like, let's nervous. Get, let's get all this stuff. So most of those ships are built from, we, we just needed an enormous amount of stuff. Yeah. And so Gary and his team, uh, you know, because again, the thing about NASA is those ships, uh, uh, there's no walls, it's all storage space. You have to take everything with you. Um, so Gary and his team, the, you know, you'd get a, a, enough stuff to fill this theater and it will go into sort of a 20 by 20 cube by time. <laughs> like, oh shit, we're gonna need some more stuff. So, <laughs> you know, we it looked like, and, and your team was looking at us like we were out of our minds because all these crazy old galleys came in. And so, I mean, it was, it was you know, an enormous amount of work for the set deck like department. building a giant model. Of it was just a huge warehouse, like Nathan said, the, the parking lot was full of galleys and inside the warehouse we had a shop and we manufactured a lot. There were some very talented uh, prop shop people and uh, we'd just line everything up in shelves and Nathan would come in with uh, his art directors and set designers and they would be fighting over the pieces, you know, and they'd take it and do a drawing and... I mean, it was every, I mean we, we managed to get six Nimrod, you know, planes, interiors out of England that just been this dismantled so we shipped all that stuff yeah. over you know we couldn't get enough i couldn't get our yeah. hands on enough stuff yeah. it was um ireland ireland we shipped it from ireland of all places so um, um well this is going to roll into that that question because also like um with adam you've had the unique opportunity to work with uh, um christopher nolan on multiple pictures. I want you to share a little bit of your conceptual process of working with him uh, in, the, in the garage, if you would, um, and whether you would recommend, because it's clearly successful for you guys, whether that's something you would recommend for other people. <laughs> well, I mean, like Adam, it's great, you know, Chris becomes a friend and, you know, we, we do early discussions in his house and you're part of the script process, so, which is essential. Um, but, you know, on this film, I think I was saying to someone, you know, everything, the design was you know, so tricky and ambitious and had to be original that, you know, we, you know, where do you start? And we, you know, the great thing about being in the garage, I remember the first day I moved my stuff in. Um, what, what did you move in? What was your stuff? Well, I just, we'd gone a bit digital, so I moved in the 3D printers and the <laughs> computers and the model boxes kind of, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, you know, the Chris says, oh, well, let's get into it. Let's, let's do the inside of the black hole. It's like, well, really? This is day one. Uh, <laughs> I was like, all right. But, you know, <laughs> so, so that was day one. And then it came very clear to me. It was like, oh, no, we've got ships, robots, black holes. These are... Wormholes, too. Yeah, wormholes. It was like, <laughs> Paul Franklin's like, you've got to have this one. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> so it was... Um, but the garage is really important. It's private time. If you can, the thing about design, every designer in here knows that if, you, if you've got an enormous department to give work to, that means you have no time to do your own work. So um, it, it's essential to have private time with a director to design together. And it's essential that you uh, get on and have the same taste because, you know, the worst thing with the wrong director is when your taste doesn't hit. I think that's always becomes the most difficult of jobs. Um, so that relationship is, is essential. K 
can you please talk, Gary, a little bit about, I, I, I guess you did the, the farmhouse and the cornfields up in Alberta, Canada. Yes. Was the interior of the farmhouse done there as well? Yes. Oh, yeah. oh Nathan cool. built the farmhouse and we, we did the, the And interiors, then can you talk everything. about your character study stuff for the interior of that house? It was such a character in the film. I mean, the, the earth-based Well, stuff. it was a couple generations. Um, uh, it was Matt, the character Cooper's wife's father's house or grandfather who settled there. Um, uh, we couldn't reflect too much in terms of how old that was. I, it basically, uh, yeah, I'm kind of losing it here, really. Uh, well, c c let's talk about Cooper. He was a mechanic, so we right. had his workshop, and he was in all the stuff that he worked with in terms of uh, communications equipment and such, and then the little girl, and we had some, the, the bedroom where the which she lived in was her mother's bedroom. And that's where With all the, the books. books came from, right. right. And the uh, books, I mean, forgive me, but it seemed uh, like the books started a whole, like, linear, repeated well, pattern right, right. that went up through the whole the film. That's the story, right, where the, the gravity and right. crossing over time. It was and, cool. Um, I mean, I yeah, it was Gary's job to take us out of the Dust Bowl era and modernize it with right. where he could in that interior because you know it was a hard thing we needed that exterior uh farmhouse to be familiar but we n we did need to bring it forward a little bit so it was a it was you know the subtleties of what gary did were very important uh in that interior so because we we, didn't, we were not a period film well i guess we were a future period film but you know, it's, uh, you know that's you know, mcconaughey was talking matthew mcconaughey was talking about early on that he was good with he was a craftsman and so we had that ta a table built from a nakashima design and i talked to him about that and he says oh yeah that's right i, I could have built that table he was very excited about that table <laughs> <laughs> well we want it we want them to be excited about what we do for them um nathan uh, 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 important question because and, and unless my assumption is wrong a lot of this is in camera more than people would think so you're really using CGI more as set extenders and unifiers. Yeah, Am I, I right? mean, early on, we, we, I mean, we use, Chris likes to use film in IMAX cameras. So sure. you, you have to try and take a lot of the CG work out of it. Otherwise, you're scanning the film, you're degrading it. So uh, Chris on this film early on wanted to tie all that stuff in the cockpit is projected. Uh, we created the, the CGI head in pre-production and we projected it with you know 2k projectors um 4k weren't available then outside the windows and you know we, we were kind of learning and we realized well there's something wrong with this we realized we needed to also project the same image back into the cockpits to to, to get it to live a little you know then we started you know like adam said we started learning about where projection it's kind of a it's an old method with new technology, you know, we were just creating the, the, the CG work first, but we took it all the way into the black hole where a lot of that construct of Merce room moving mm -hmm. in time off three axes, it, it was built and uh, the texture, the running texture, the movement is with about 16 2K projectors firing on, on, onto the set. And then obviously the, the distant stuff is CG. Right. So, I mean, we, we sort of have this policy we, of, trying to do as much in camera to inform the CG. We've always done that. It's been driven really by the IMAX film. Right. Um, like the ship landing in Iceland, we, we took that ship out there, the hydraulic gear is real, that landing shot is off a crane in the middle of the sea, you know, there, that pod is in the glacier, you know, you, what? How did you get that pod in the glacier? I was really looking at this time going, that was a bitch of a day. <laughs> well, the problem with that is we, everything, every time you touch ice and again this is part of the learning process because this is my first We're pod this, school, right? <laughs> yeah, this is my first glacial <laughs> spaceship and uh <laughs> the every time you touch a set to ice the ice melts so you continually have to uh you have to keep on every day we try and touch it up so that it would meet the ice and look buried so and really it was like an icelandic crew who just literally carved a road with chainsaws up into the ice and you know, uh, you're working crampons, uh, 
I mean, I find it, I love it, uh, you know, out in that weather because you, that's what you get on film. You get this weather comes in and you, you get something that you, you don't get on the soundstage. So I think that's really important for the film that you get that. To me, there's no place like home. So, you know, there's no good alternative to Earth. And so that was an important point in, in our story. Uh, and Iceland kind of, you know, the, the hardship of making those sets up there kind of drove that home. I mean, we had a storm blow in on us uh, that took the tarmac off the road. So, um, you know, it was insane. <laughs> I remember trying to walk up to set with Chris and it was like, well, we're we going anywhere. And uh, he was like, I've got to shoot, I've got to shoot, I've got to shoot. I can't sit in a hotel with a bunch of actors. So, <laughs> so but, you know, that's... I, I find that stuff fantastic. Well, that's why we do this, because no one else is going to let you do this kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Man. <laughs> and it promotes drinking at night. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Can we have the clip for Into the Woods, please?